All right, folks, good evening. This is Travis Oscar Mike Radio, and it literally is evening. I'm remote to parts unknown because I'm with, and look, the planets, the sun, the moon all aligned, and I am sitting with Megan Bruce, who's been on Oscar Mike Radio before. Somehow, some way, we are in the same exact place at the same exact time in person. Crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Megan, <laughs> thank you for coming back for number 156 for Oscar Mike Radio. Well, thanks for having me for 156. Absolutely. It's been a while, but uh, we've kept in touch. You've been up to so much. Before we get going, I want to say a big thanks to my sponsor, uh, Joyce Asak of Asak Realty. Hi, this is Joyce Asak with Remax Synergy. I am a real estate agent that services the South Shore. You can follow me on Facebook or Instagram by following Joyce Asak at Asak Real Estate or my website, asakrealestate.com. You can also reach me directly at 508-942-7146. For any buyers or sellers that I'll be working with in 2019, a donation will be made in their name to 22 Kill. You're here in Boston, the birthplace of our country, so to speak. You've been all around. We've talked before. We've kept in touch. But it seems like that you are literally Oscar Mike all the time. What's what's going on with (laughs) Megan? Um, Well, I've been on the road for five weeks now, which is nuts. Um, I'm exhausted, thoroughly, thoroughly exhausted, ready to go home. But... (laughs) Um, I'm kind of on a mission right now. So I'm collecting stories from, I guess I'm filming stories from women all across the country who were Marines at some point. And I had so many spots I needed to go to. I just thought this would be the most, like, this would be the best way. And I could just drive and hit all of them. So I'm basically doing a big circle around the country. If I was correct, last time we really talked, you were really thinking about acting and media production and movie storytelling. So this, is this part of that journey or is that kind of on hold? It is in a way because there, um, there is a movie being written not about this but certain parts of it. As far as acting and just the stuff I do on my own, it has... I guess been put on hold. Yeah, absolutely. And, and video production, which is, I have a, I have a lot (laughs) that I need to get to editing to put out there. So yeah, I I really did have to put it on hold and it kind of sucks because there's been so many times on this journey where I'm just like, what am I doing? Like I'd much rather just be back at home doing, you know, putting out my own stuff and going to auditions and getting my name out there and, you know, being with my son. And, and, and here I am on, on a mission. And It is a mission. I mean, you know, when we started talking, you got really candid with me a couple times about why you were doing this. And we kind of revisited it again tonight. And it seems like this is not just a mission. This is this is a, a real focus for you. Yeah, I've been working on this project for two years now, uh, collecting stories and building an audience. So um, I have not only people's support, because, I mean, people's support is it's really encouraging and it's kind of key if you want to get, you know, what you're trying to convey to the world out there. Um, so, like, everything I've done to this point, the the videos I started with, which were always videos about what women go through in the military or talked about MST, which is military sexual trauma. You know, I was going through the comments and I was looking for women who I could tell had something relevant to say to, you know, what I'm trying to put out there. And that's kind of that's how I found my the people I'm interviewing is really it was the comments of my videos and then there's a few from um, military groups where they were a little open not fully but they kind of hinted at stuff vaguely and so I reached out to them and I you know I asked them like what's your story like you know if you're willing to talk about it and I kind of told them a little bit of my project it's funny because like some people that I'm interviewing now I I I told them about this project two years ago (laughs) and it's like, I'm finally doing it. You know, but I, I had to, I had to build confidence for one in, in myself 
on camera and working a camera. Um, and I had to, you know, there's a lot of fear when you're going to, when you're about to do something and put everything in your life on hold and put everything you've saved up and, you know, and just all in, like I had, I was, I'm all in at this point. Like I, I just, I had to get rid of all my bills. Like I, I, this is it. This is all I'm doing. And until this is done, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not allowing myself to go back to the life I had. Like, and it, I mean, it, this isn't going to be like that long and it'll be, you know, a month or two. Or From what it seems like, you've really sold out on this to your earlier point. And this is not just something like, hey, I'm here, you know, come audition for me. Like you're trying to really, it seems like, dig into the story and connect with the people that can affect change for what you're trying to do. And that is this scourge, this this bane of sexual uh, harassment and trauma that plagues our military. It is about MST. And so so the interviews are going a, a certain way. It's it's There's three parts to it. And it's like, why did you join? What were your expectations? What, what did you want to get out of it? And then it um, goes into what was the actual experience? And then who were you after and like how did you deal with certain things um and a lot of it it's like homelessness drug abuse you know getting into abusive relationships and so so it's bringing all that in into the light and now that it's starting to come in the light and you're starting to connect with people what what do you find out when you're talking to a fellow female marine about her story what's yeah, it's Every time I have an interview, because there's it, there's been a lot of lows on this journey. Like, for instance, when I was driving through the desert for three days from California to Texas. Like, yes. anybody can get lost in the desert for three days, right? Like, that's the worst or best place to do it. So <laughs> I was questioning what I was doing the entire time. It was like the very beginning of my trip. But every story I film, it reminds me of what I'm doing. And I, I'm like, I remember what, where I was, you know, six years ago. Because this is, this is personal to you, if I may ask. It's, it's, it's personal. It's not some project that you got from school or you knew. Was oh gonna, God, no, no. This, this <laughs> is, this is close to you. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I said six years. It was, it was eight years ago, actually. Um, eight years ago, I got out of the military, and I was, I was so lost. And I, I didn't think anybody really cared. And I was married at the time to a combat vet. And I was so focused on his problems and helping him. And it's like, I, I wasn't realizing like how much, I mean, I was realizing how much it affected me. I just, I wasn't talking about it. I wasn't telling people, you know, and, and I mean, unless it, I got drunk and broke down and like you know and it was like this huge panic attack and sobbing whatever you know how it goes when you're when you get out of like a traumatic experience and you can't wrap your mind around it and you're still trying to figure out like what what you just went through and on top of like how you how everyone treated it like it was nothing to them when you're like it was what do you mean it was nothing? Like, if that happened in the civilian world, like, he would be in prison for 20 years. So, like, what do you mean? Like, it's just, it blows my mind. And, and then to to be a victim of a, a rape and, and to see, like, no justice whatsoever, it, it messes with your head. Like, you think, well, you know, like, I know what it was, but, like, is that not how they're interpreting, like, interpreting the word rape like it 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 fucks with your head sorry i don't know if i'm allowed to say the other word no okay. this is this is this is a <laughs> my, my field of fucks is barren so you know, don't don't worry about it um <laughs> we're, we're getting real here so back to your question the whole reason why i'm doing this is and the whole reason why i started doing video and getting back into acting because acting for me is just a tool um, that I can use to, um, you know, get those original videos out there so I could be comfortable on camera to show people, like, these stories through characters or whatever. And now it's, you know, now it's not a character. Now it's me, which is 
scary because I'm putting myself out there for the first time time and it's like well it's a very vulnerable position it's ter- like when i do a character it's no big deal because i'm hiding behind that character you can say whatever you want about the character because i don't care i don't take offense to it. it's not me so but like here i'm i'm putting but everything people, out no wait, wait a minute hold on, hold on. <laughs> but people thought you were the character that's, that's that was that yeah. it, they did and it was absolutely funny yeah um just a little humor so many people thought that Daisy was real. Oh, yeah. And I'll have the links to those uh, videos in the, the, the blog post, folks. But people thought you were real. But you've been able to take that now and use that to build this project, right? Yeah. And, you know, I wanted men to feel included because if men aren't included in the conversation, then there's not going to be any change because this, ha- this is a cultural change. It's not like angry women, you know, like, I mean, yes, we're fucking angry, but unless unless we are able to speak to men at at, I don't want to say their level or whatever but you know if we're not including men in the conversation then then culture doesn't change so when I I played certain characters I I wanted to do things that appealed to both genders just military people in general like not everyone knows what it's like to go to combat not everyone knows what an MST is like. Not everyone knows what it's like, you know, in the army or, or a certain branch. But everyone for sure knows who's ever been in the military, what it's like to live in a military town. Or, True. or knows what the town is right off base. So I came up with a character that everybody in the military, even their wives, could find humor in. For sure. Uh, still laugh about that because it was, people thought it was it was real. And you do that and you get some confidence and you say, I guess, what when did it happen that you said, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this project. Challenges be damned. I'm right. going to do this. Okay, so um, two years ago, well, we're in summertime now, so it was actually two and a half years ago, I, I had my house broken into by a stalker and it um it brought everything back like full force like everything that happened to me like I just I felt so afraid I felt like I was cursed I felt like there's no way out and now I have a son and if my son was home what would he have done to my son you know so like it's just like all these god almighty statements that are just like you know, there's no way out at this point. Like this is going to keep happening to me. And so at that point, I just, I saw no way out, but through death. And so I tried to kill myself in my sister's bathtub. And, um, I, when I was recovering in the hospital, um, my dad called me and he said, Megan, I don't know what you need to do with your life, but you need to find another purpose. Like you need to do something that gives you, you know, not, not just purpose, but you're getting power back. You need your power back right, because right. whatever was taken from you in the Marine Corps, like you need to get it back. And so that's why I started doing um, videos on MST and what women go through and giving a voice to women who couldn't articulate it or who didn't feel sh- strong enough to articulate it. And so he, my dad was like, he's a, he's a filmmaker, camera guy, producer, kind of, you know, all inclusive. And so he was, you know, teaching me how to do, do camera. And my grandmother was, you know, I, I was, I grew up as an actress because of my grandmother and forcing it upon me (laughs) but um so I was just kind of putting the tools together that my family had taught me and I was like my my ultimate dream here is to get stories across the country um or I didn't say across the country at the time but you know like throughout the Marine Corps for females and to get their stories and to show the world like all of it like I could I could have just started with my story and just left it at that but then it wouldn't show a pattern and it, 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 we need, we need to show society or I think we need to show society that this happens so often. And for a lot of people in, like in my case, it wasn't just one isolated event. It, after something happens to you, you are left vulnerable for more attacks and, and, 
and after you report things and nothing's done, then you just you're you're taught not to report things because you know what happened last time. Like you you reported something, but because you know for whatever reason, like you were underage drinking when it happened, you got sent to the fucking brig and he, nothing happened to him. Like like, I mean, just unbelievable stories. And so anyway. Two years ago, this was this has been my plan since then, and I'm just kind of coming around to it now because a, a lot of it, like, there's a lot of self doubt, and like, do I really want to like live in the past? Do I really want to do this? And and when I could just move on with my life because my career was taking off, and I'm like, this feels great, you know, this makes me happy, and and my son makes me happy, and like this life, I, I'm I love it, you know, and and. And another part of me is like, I can't just sit idly by and let it happen to more women and let all those other women out there who who don't feel like they have a voice, who don't have an audience or who aren't brave enough to do it. I can't I can't just leave them like I I'd feel like I'm leaving a, a Marine behind, you know, and and maybe the Marine Corps at least brainwashed me that much that. I didn't feel okay just moving on with my career until I accomplished what I set out to do in the first place. And that's what I'm doing right now. As you've gone through this journey and talked to women who have experienced what you've experienced, you talk about a pattern. And I wondered if you would tell me what is the pattern? Because I think a lot of civilians who do listen to this podcast think that is, you know, the military works like civilian life. If, 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 you know, a woman walks in the police station, there's a, a things that have to happen and there is transparency and there, there is a chain of events, but I don't think people understand the military works differently. The big part of this uh, film I'm, I'm working on is I'm not only stating all the problems and all the problem areas, but I'm also giving solutions. What are, what are the solutions? Because you, th- you think it's common sense, but there's more to it than that. Sure. Okay, so for starters, and this would be the biggest one that would, it would just change the whole game for women joining the military and, you know, the few, the few men that it happens to as well, is that the UCMJ has no jurisdiction over sexual assaults, like, the, or sexual crimes, so instead of the UCMJ, which is, I'm sorry, the military justice system, instead of the military justice system handling sexual crimes, it goes straight to civilian courts because the UCMJ has not taken it serious this entire time and it, it'd rather sweep it under the rug, send the woman away, and keep the man in. Because it's how, that, I mean, we're, we're it's, a, it's a boys club, it's, it was designed that way and the UCMJ I think really was designed you know because when you're on deployment when you're overseas like they need a judicial system but now that majority of us are are um, having careers back home things are things should change things should progress and now that women are in and and these things are not being dealt with properly so if civilian courts had jurisdiction over sexual crimes, they would be taken serious. And when you take a crime serious and you give consequences to, in this case, rapist, then that, that stops the problem. It, it shows that people cannot get away with rape in the military. And right now, it's a very well-known fact, and if it's not, like I'm just going to say it, not to put it out there to rapists, but just to put it out there to society, like, you can get away with it in the military. And and that creates a breeding ground for rapists. So are you saying that, let's just say rape happens, the woman shouldn't go to the MPs or the provost marshal. She should go right to her local police department and file their claim there and have it immediately go into the civilian system. So, I mean, the way the military's um, designed now, you, you have to go through your chain of command. Right. Yes, exactly. When NCIS told me 
that they were going to drop my case. They said, you know, um, you can take it up through civil court. And, and the, at the very most, they were, so I could have prosecuted, you know, but it, it would, I would have had to do it through civil court and I would have had to get, you know, police reports that happened in a foreign country. So it, I mean, it was almost an impossible task and, and a foreign country that does not respect women and would not even work with me as far as like the medical staff and me. I mean, it was so invasive and it was. So what, what you're saying then is the minute this is reported, the chain of command cannot keep it in the chain of command. Some civilian oversight entity has to be involved. They take ownership of this. That is what I'd like to see. And by doing that, you're saying that the the perceived notion that it's a boys club or the very real notion it's a boys club, either or, because some people say, well, it's just perception. Some people yeah. say it's for real. Mm-hmm. Either or, either or, right, right. this gets a broader light on it. Um, yeah, I mean, just the stories I have collected alone um everyone that has reported and it's almost every single person has reported um or at least everyone has reported the first thing that happened to them uh absolutely zero got done zero zero whether it stopped at the duty what they went straight to the duty reported something the duty did nothing or it went all the way to trial and the judge did nothing so from from every part of the command um, to to the UCMJ, nothing was done, and it, it always ended. And I mean, there's stories where these you know predators were allowed to get away with it, and then because there was no consequences for them, they went off and did even worse stuff. Which I know it's like, what could be worse than rape, <laughs> murder, you know? And like, because it taught them that they can get away. There's no consequences to their right, actions. Right. It's like if I never gave my son time out, if I never spaked my son, he would know that he could get away with whatever he wanted to do, which would be to eat candy all day and play video games. And <laughs> well, on, on one hand, you have no trouble getting him to eat vegetables. I mean, <laughs> you, you use some mind trickery to get him to do it. But so so that's one aspect. Is there another solution? I mean, that that would solve a lot of it, it sounds like. And you're not the first woman who's told me, Travis, if we got the civilian oversight, this would be solved overnight. Absolutely. Is there anything but is there anything else that staff sergeant, that lieutenant, that captain can do on the small unit level to make sure that the Marines and or soldiers and sailors are being to take nope. things seriously, right, right. Or, no, I mean that. I mean, honestly, that would be it. To take things seriously, and to not blame who it just happened to. I mean, I can remember after being followed into a shower trailer at two o'clock in the morning, um, overseas, and and coming out, identifying the guy who fucking went in there after me, identifying him, and because. I had been har- harassed and reported harassment on my deployment prior to this. She looks at me and she goes, what's your problem? Why does this keep happening to you? A woman told you this. Yes. It was a female gunnery sergeant. And I was just like, are you fuck?" I'm like, I, I am identifying him. He's right in front of me. And I'm, of course I'm crying and I'm, I'm like shook up. And because I was just fucking, you know, like somebody just followed me into a shower trailer when I was naked and wet. Like how much more vulnerable could you be besides like completely passed out, you know, and come out. We find him. I identify him. And she's like, looks me in the eye and says, I'm trying not to throw an F-bombs, looks me in the eye and says, you're too hysterical to identify anyone. And then sends the guy away. Oh, okay. So how, she did uh, not take it serious. This why, guy got why away would, with it. Why would another female gunnery sergeant, a staff and SEAL, not take it serious? Because she saw me as a problem. Because because it was um, there were there were other harassment issues on that deployment, and I reported them. Or I mean, really, other people reported them who saw them, and and so I was seen as like 
someone to keep an eye out on. Not that I was a troublemaker. I was. I was. I always did what I. But you said you know. a problem. Huh? Uh, you were a problem to them. Yes, that's exactly how I felt. Like I was. Look, I, I've had, I've had, um, corp like my NCOs from that deployment. Like I've had them apologize to me, and I know a lot of them. Most of them probably thought they were doing the best they could for the circumstances. You know, uh, or maybe they never had to really fully deal with that much harassment coming on to one person. But I don't I don't blame like I blame her because I like blatantly told her, like, that's the guy, you know, and like he gets away with it. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to do it again. And next time, if it's somebody that looks a little more weaker than I look, he's probably going to try something. Going through this journey, have you gotten the kind of support? that you thought you were going to get or has it been more or less? Um, I have more support than I could have ever dreamed. And I, I mean, just being starting my journey in San Antonio, Texas, there's a lot of, um, I mean, it's a huge veteran community and there's a lot of veteran owned companies down there and they, they just embraced me and they, I think in the way I explain what I'm doing, where um, this is, I don't ever want to make this a male versus female issue. Like, I just, you know, want to create change and I have solution to those changes. You know, I'm not just putting nonsense out there or just stories out there with no solution, you know. But um, I, they totally just embraced me and I, I feel like I have so much support, like so much support. And and I reached out to a lot of people in my chain of command to um, and, and some of my NCOs to just kind of, you know, re confirm my story for one and and to um, to, to support me on this. And even ones that I couldn't stand <laughs> back in the day for whatever reason, we, I just don't like working with a person. Um, it, it seems like. Every time I reach out to somebody, they want to help. And, I mean, I've gotten resistance from um, a couple people, but only because they felt threatened for whatever reason, and that's not my issue, that's theirs, and I just move on. You know, because I'm here for people that want to make a difference, that want solutions to problems, not to become a problem. You know, so if, if you're willing to work with me, awesome. And so far, it's been almost every single person that I've reached out to. So in a way, you started this two years ago, and it's coming together. The, the, the ingredients are all in the pot, and you're making it. You know, what are you hoping happens as a result of this? And, and how is this video, how is this documentary, I'm going to call it documentary because yeah, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> how is this going to be the fulcrum that really makes change, do you think? Um, it's not just the documentary. It's A big part of it is the military sexual trauma movement. And that is what is already creating change. And they've had, um, they've had cases where I think 13 cases by now where they've brought, um, they've brought things to chain of commands to, you know, fix this with evidence. And every single one of them was taken care of. So it's, I'm not doing this on my own. Absolutely not. I, you know, there, there is, um, there is like a gathering of women who are, are angry about what they've experienced and they're not going to stand for it anymore. They're not going to let the next female generation of female Marines endure what we had to endure. We're going to make sure that they don't have to go through what we had to go through. And so it, it's, it's a whole movement. And I'm just a piece of that puzzle. I certainly think this aligns with people who start off with what they have and they, they use what they have to make change or to make something happen. And it seems like watching you go through this journey that people see that you're sincere and that you're really not making this about yourself, but it is kind of about yourself. 
do you, are you doing this? And I'm going to say this because I just kind of want to give people mm-hmm. a place to go. Are you doing this under Sergeant Megan? How can people connect with your journey as you're taking it? And do you do you want them to connect right now? Or do you want them to just kind of be aware of what you're doing? Of course I want them to connect so they can stay in touch with my journey. And, and then when I have a finished product, you know, obviously watch it. Yeah, my, my handle is Sergeant Megan on Facebook and Instagram. And that's that's the best place to find me. Changing gears a little bit, changing gears a little bit, um, because you have used Vito to get to this point. You just got finished with a, like a history show or a pilot you were doing. I did, yeah. <laughs> and and how, how was that? Because it seemed like you were something out of that show Vikings. You were all face painted and, yes. and you really em, embraced that. And, and one thing I, I, I'm getting, you, you, you turn the throttle and you embrace what you go after. I, yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I did a lot of research too. Really? I... Oh yeah, because because it's not comedy, so <laughs> comedy is easy. You can you I mean you can do anything with it, and you know it, you can just call it all a joke. You know, but <laughs> when you're doing something serious, it's a it's a whole nother level of like I got to get this right. You know, especially when it's history, and I love history. I'm a history buff, and so yeah, so I have a history show. It's about women warriors throughout history, and I started with. Boudica, who's the uh, who's the queen of the Iceni people, who's a Celtic tribe in today Britain, Eastern Britain. I started with her, and then the next one is Deborah Sampson. For any patriots out there, you'd love her story. She is like the Milan of the Revolutionary right, War. Right, right, yeah. She disguised herself as a dude, and then uh, she uh, ended up pulling a bullet out of her own leg and stitching herself up because she didn't want to be found out. So instead of going to the infirmary, she just went off and, like, healed herself, which she never really healed from it. Uh, I think she was the first woman. Yeah, she's the first woman to petition Congress. Sorry, i got to change modes here in <laughs> my old scripts. She's the first woman to petition Congress for a pension, and she got it. So that was pretty cool. And uh, and, and then Boudica, she, um, she had one of the biggest rebellions, or the biggest re- Celtic rebellion, against um against the roman empire where she just demolished um well not, not demolished but we'll, we'll say casualties 70,000 casualties in of of romans or roman supporters you know who who lived in the three biggest cities in britain she just went through and burned them down because they they flogged her and took away everything she had and then raped her little girls little girls like less than 10 years old so she just went on this rampage and was like, "Uh, uh-uh, fuck that! You're not gonna, you're not gonna get away with this room." Like, <laughs> it's it's almost like if you could do that today, you'd solve a lot of problems too, Megan. But oh, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> now we but, gotta be like political and you know. Um, but but you're ethical. you're doing this and, and watching you kind of I wouldn't say mature, but definitely embrace this. I'm really excited to see it done. It's it's very motivating to me. Uh, we talked almost what a year and a half, two years ago, and to watch this happen. Still very friendly with some female Marines I serve with. They're great friends, better sisters. Very entertaining at times. Uh, I tell all my young Marine guys that hey, you know, if you if you do it right, you can get you can get female Marines to do all kinds of crazy stuff for you. And it, it's true. It, it's great. Uh, they'll check out your girlfriend for you and tell you if she sucks. They'll you know call Be you your wingman. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and it's just a really great thing. So what I'm trying to say here as we wrap down, it's just, it's been great from an artist perspective, people uh, being able to bounce ideas off Megan and every now and then when she's not, when she stands still long enough to, you know, answer a text, she'd be like, well, you know, we think about this or that sucked or that. And it's just not, it's nice having that. It's nice having that, that, that artist spirit. So I just uh, really appreciate, it's a Sunday night. You know, you got to get up early in the morning, go interview. I got to go to work. Um, it's well, like I said, you were my first, so my, <laughs> my first radio interview. So I'll always have a spot for you in my schedule somewhere. <laughs> well, it, it's it's very flattering, and uh, it, it's been cool to kind of be along for the ride. But I really, I really believe it's a problem. I really believe that women, men should be able to go to work. And come home and, you know, go to work again the next day without worrying about it. And um, for what it's worth and for what I have on my side, uh, I'm behind you all the way. 
Thank you. So we're wrapping down 156. We are in Boston. Uh, Sergeant Megan, Nutmeg as I call her, is on the move. She is Oscar Mike, and you're going to want to check out her stuff as she produces it. And I'm excited to see the finished product, and I'm with you. God bless y'all.